I mean, that's really stuck with me over the years because I'm going to tell you something. I watch a lot of people profit lie. Amen? It's amazing. But we'll fight over it. This is my, as a man of God, that's a woman of God. She says it, he says it must be true. Well, guess what? I don't care who you're listening to, including this old boy right here. Ain't nobody ever got it right every time. Are you listening? I wouldn't lead you astray for anything in this world. I do my due diligence. I study. I read and I do the best that I can to listen from the Holy Spirit about what to tell you and what to say for you. If I know it's wrong, I will adjust it every single time. But no matter how we spend, no matter how much preparation we put into it, nobody, I mean nobody, understands the mind of God exactly. And it is arrogance to act like you know it. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> we need to get, I thought this is about Christmas, man. I, go back to the Christmas tree thing. This is getting rough. I spent last week trying to move you from that place where we get hung up on stupid things so we could actually worship God in the season that God has, and you listen to me, that God has created to worship him in. God is the one that set this thing in motion. It wasn't the devil that decided every secular government on planet earth was going to start celebrating Jesus' birth on the 25th. The devil didn't do that. But we'll fight over that. Jesus wasn't born on the 25th. I know. You'd be surprised. I know. And if you didn't know, now you know. You, you don't know when because nobody knows when. I pulled up a guy on the internet the other day and he's, uh, he, Jesus born on June 14th. I don't, I don't know how he knows, but he knows. Silly. And I mean, it was like one post after another. He was not, he was da, 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 it's just like, I mean, we're just fighting. I'm thinking, good grief, do we actually make any sense at all to a lost and dying world? It's amazing how much time we waste on stupid stuff. It is time that we understand there's only a few things worth fighting for like that. Now, if you want to believe mid-trip, post-trip, after trip, no trip, I don't care what you believe. I'm going to tell you why I read the Bible. I'm going to tell you what I believe. Are you with me? And I'm going to tell you that you and I both might be wrong. Uh -uh. I've been watching this guy 20 years. He's a prophet. When I first came here years ago, we watched a, a series on a guy that was going through Revelation, and he knew a lot of stuff, and he brought a lot of new stuff out, and I hadn't seen it before, but I'm telling you right now. And, and the lady that brought, uh, brought me the, the, the DVD series, I mean, she was like a disciple of this guy. Are you listening? I mean, everything he said. She hung on every word. And after I got to going through it, I decided, hey, this has got a lot of good information, and I can fix the stuff he's messing up. So that's what I did. We watched the video series, and after every video, the stuff he's messing up, I got up and said, you know, this, this ain't right. Are you listening? She got so mad at me. She goes to somebody else's church now. Are you listening? So the majority of the things we fight each other over are worthless. They won't amount to anything in eternity. You mark this preacher's words. The majority of the things we get so fighting mad about won't amount to one thin dime in eternity. God won't even bring them up. Now, having said that, there are a couple, a few things that are non-negotiable. Now, you can argue with me about tongues if you want to. I'll tell you, I'll show you in the word where speaking in tongues 
it's still for today. It's the promises unto you, your children, your children's children, as many as the Lord thy God shall call. You can choose to believe that or choose not to believe that. That's up to you. I will show you. I'll tell you anecdotally. You, you tell me there ain't no such thing as the infilling of the Holy Ghost or speaking in tongues, but I already got it, okay? So you can talk about Pentecostals all you want to. I am one. And since I am one, I know what I'm talking about. But you can believe it or not believe it because I have learned something. On the flip side of that, there are a lot of people that will fight that same battle with me. But when they get through talking in tongues on, in church on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, take that same tongue outside the building and start gossiping and backbiting and lying and coming against all kinds, kinds of sorts of people. So I don't care if you speak in tongues 23 hours out of the day. If you spend the other hour using your tongue for the devil... I don't put much stock in what you have. So fight about it if you want to. I know what's real. I know what's true. And you can believe it or not believe it. I'm not going to send you to hell if you don't talk in tongues. And you won't believe this. There's a lot of Pentecostal denomination, or a few at least, that will do just that. There's no Bible for it. Are you listening? But they'll sure do it. Silly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So watch this. I said all of that to try to get you to come along with me just a little bit on a couple of things. I'm going to read you something. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. This is the English Standard Version of Matthew 1.18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, are you listening? She was found to be with child from the Holy Ghost. Now, this is the time of year when all the secular people lose their mind. Amen. Secular columnists, secular, I mean, they just can't stand it. If you believe in the virgin birth, to them, it's like you've just checked out. Intellectually, you just checked out. In fact, I've got, uh, uh, here, here's something. Let me see this, see if I got it in here. New York Times writer wrote this. The faith in the virgin birth reflects the way American Christianity is becoming less intellectual and more mystical over time. The problem with that is, is that more people believed it when we started than believe it today. Are you listening? So it's not becoming more mystical. It's becoming more secular. Here's the deal. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is non-negotiable. There's a lot of things I won't argue with you about, but I will, I will argue over that from now until Jesus comes and gets me. You think it's that important? I do think it's that important. In fact, I don't believe you can be a Christian and not believe it. You better listen to what I'm saying. Let's think about it for just a minute. Secular people, this is what they say. Since only two gospels mention the virgin birth, it must be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you can choose it or not choose it. Optional. That's what it must be optional. Since only two of the gospel writers mentioned it. But not just the gospel writers. Isaiah prophesied it 800 years before. Are you listening? He said the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will get with child. Are you listening? Now, not just that. I want you to think about this, and I'm going to move on. The process in the Semitic tradition of that day for someone caught in adultery is like this. And I want you to think about it because the, 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 the angel proclaims to Mary that the Lord has done this. But in Mary's culture, they say she was 13. I, 
I don't know how they know that, but they, exactly, I know where they derive it from, but I don't know how to prove it. But at very least, she was very young at the time. Okay? She, in her culture, if you, and the Bible says she was betrothed to Joseph. Now watch this. Betrothed, this is the process in Judaism. You would, a, a, a suitor and the, and the and, or so the, the male and the female, <laughs> Let me say that again. A male and a female. <laughs> Picked up on that, did you? Would be what was called betrothed. And that process was this. They didn't take daddy's car out to lover's leap and mess around in the back seat till nature took its course. I know this ain't going to be popular with nobody in their teens right now. Nobody going to like this. What they did was they signed a contract. Are you listening? A contract with the parents. A contract that for the next year, they would be betrothed. And basically, it was a testing time for a year. Every time you've seen each other, you were chaperoned. And that just freaks me out. I see teenagers, 13, 14, 15 years old, slam the door and say, you, you, you just won't give me my privacy. Well, guess what? If you wanted privacy, you should have been born in somebody else's house. <laughs> ain't no, ask any of my kids, ain't no teenage daughter, ain't no teenage boy going to tell me what they're going to do in my house. Are you listening? Amen? So the process where they were, they were betrothed, and so they were chaperoned for a year to see if either one of them were fit to be married. Somebody say amen. At the end of that year contract, then they entered into marriage, and they were left alone for the first time in their dating history. See, It's no wonder Western culture is so messed up. I mean, really messed up. But the process was this. If during that year's time, it didn't happen often, but if during that year's time, the young lady became pregnant during that year's time, here's the process. She was brought before the high priest, and he would do a physical examination to see if she was sexually active. This is how it went. This is Mary's day. Okay? If she, it was determined she was sexually active, then her suitor, the, her would-be husband, her future husband, since he was the one wronged. Now, it's a whole other difference deal if he's the one that made this happen. Okay? But if he didn't make this happen, which in Joseph's case, he didn't. Are you with, listening to me? Then the process would be that he threw the first stone and everyone else joined in until she was dead. That's the process. Now think about this for just a minute. Mary, if what are you going to do if, 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 if you know you've been slipping around and now this thing has happened and you know the process is they're going to check me out they're going to figure out what I've been doing and they're going to stone me to death. What would you do? Run. Run. Amen. Look at what Mary does. Mary finds out she's pregnant and runs to Elizabeth's house who is married to the priest who's going to do the examination. <laughs> And says, I'm pregnant. Are you listening? If she had one ounce of guilt, if she thought for one second she'd done anything wrong, if there was anything out of sorts with what God was doing, I promise you she wouldn't have been announcing it in Elizabeth's house. But because she had no guilt, because she hadn't done anything wrong, because the Holy Ghost is the one that conceived the child within her. Are you listening? 
the virgin birth is non-negotiable. Because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost means he's the ancient of days. His father is the ancient of days. Because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost means he wasn't born into sin like you and I. Are you listening? Because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost means that from the beginning he was full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost meant he was God incarnate. Christ with us. That's why they said call his name Emmanuel because he will be God with us. Are you listening to me this morning? Jesus Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He, his daddy is the one that spoke the stars into the sky. His daddy is the one that set the planets on their axis and in their orbit. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin because Jesus Christ was God incarnate. It's non-negotiable. Now, let me read something to you. I got to hurry up. I spent a lot of time on Charlie Brown, so. This is good. God the Father recognizes, now listen to me. Point two, my last point. It ties right in with what I just spoke to you. There is so much discussion today that Jesus wasn't actually God. And you need to hear me. If he's not born of a virgin and he's not God, he's illegitimate. And that's why they want to chip around the edges. If I can just get you to believe that it's too fantastic to believe that a virgin could give birth, then it's just a little ways away from not believing at all. This is, um, let me read you something that, and listen guys, I know, critics argue that the doctrine is just so supernatural. Modern heretics like retired Episcopal Bishop John Shelby Spong argued that doctrine was just evidence. Now listen to what was written. Listen to this. You want to talk about heresy? This is heresy. When you believe the rapture is coming is not heresy. Are you listening? You may be right. You may be wrong. But it's not heretical to be wrong. It's heretical to speak against the life, the blood, the cross, or the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's heretical. We throw that word around all the time. He's a heretic. He's a heretic. We throw it around all the time. Reality is heresy centers around Christ. That's it. Not your fringe doctrines. Are you listening? This is what he said. He said the doctrine was just evidence of the early church's overclaiming of Christ's deity. It is the entrance myth to go with the resurrection, which is the exit myth. Man, wouldn't you hate to be that guy on Judgment Day? This is an Episcopal bishop. He's supposed to have been preaching the gospel. Now he's retired. And this is the nonsense he says. This is that higher consciousness type people. Somehow you can just think better, you'll do better. Are you listening? I believe as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and he speaks. I believe that. But this is a different, this is humanism. Are you listening? This is saying that there is no the God, there's just us gods. That we're all part of this collective consciousness that is God. It is a demonic movement. But this is the story they tell. So listen. Some revisionist evangelicals claim that belief in the virgin birth is unnecessary. The meaning of the miracle is enduring. 
they argue, but the historical truth of the doctrine is not important. Really? I watch. Although contested, this is not in question. Jesus was the Son of God. Here's, here's, the, here's what the word says. He has fulfilled for us their children by raising Jesus. Also, it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The writer to the Hebrews said, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Matthew wrote, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Think about it. The testimony of the angel Gabriel, when announcing the upcoming birth of Jesus to Mary, the angel Gabriel said this, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And you better hear me. And I'm closing. This is the celebration. This is the time. And next week with God's help, I'm, I'm going to try to wrap this all up in a nice little package. But in case you didn't catch it, the process has been this. For three weeks, we talked about praise and thanksgiving. To prepare your heart to understand what this is about. We hear, and I use this phrase, and I, Jesus is the reason for the season. He is the reason for the season. Okay? But we've heard it so much, it's been put on so, so many bumper stickers that that it doesn't, matter, it doesn't have the impact it used to have. But the reality is we are going to leave this building and what you're going to see and all these stores and all this stuff hanging in the windows, all of this was made possible by a virgin birth. <laughs> While we are going through this season, we need to be keenly aware of why we are going through this season. I love this time. I like getting with my family. I like getting with my getting together with my friends. I like gifts. Somebody say amen. Oh, I don't care if I get anything. You know, I just like giving. <laughs> you ain't none of y'all telling the truth. None. I do like giving. I do enjoy it. But I like getting gifts too. Are you listening? I mean, I love giving something in people's life, faces just light up. I love it. And I also like Bass Pro Cards. I couldn't remember if I'd thrown that out there this season yet. <laughs> Bass Pro bought Cabela's, so Cabela's is okay now. I like most everything about Christmas. I like getting together with family, the giving season. I like all of that. But we are supposed to remember. We are supposed to be the example. No matter what room you walk into from now to Christmas Day, you are to be the evangelist in the room. Are you listening? We need not forget this is an opportunity to praise him, to bring attention to him, and you better bring it in the right light. Amen? So my prayer is, is that three weeks of preaching on Thanksgiving now two weeks of talking about what you don't need to focus on 
And at the end of this message, trying to make sure you understand there's only a few things to fight over at Christmas time. And past that, let it go. Because you're going to lose your influence. Because you got so nasty, nobody's going to believe you even know the Jesus you claim to know. If somebody wants to talk to you about who Jesus is, then have that conversation. You're the evangelist. If somebody wants to argue with you about who Jesus is, it's okay, within reason, you better listen to me, to contend for the faith, but do not get trapped or wrapped up in the devil's ploy for you to destroy your influence. There's a saying, when I was coming up, we heard it all the time that you're the only Bible some people will ever read. I've heard it all my life. I mean, all my life, I've heard it. It's another saying, bumper sticking, small sticker, small slogan, whatever you want to call it, that is way, was way overused and it lost its power. It just happens, though, to be the truth. And here's my last, for today, here's my last challenge. If you're going to leave here and enter any door during this Christmas season, and not act like a Christian, do us all a favor. And don't tell the people you're around you are one. Let me say that again. If you're going to leave here and enter any place, any door, any party, any anything, and not act like Christ, please quit telling people this is what he looks like. Now, I get it. That's not shouting and grab. But it's true. And it's real. And if we'll be a little more thoughtful about what we do. See, because, listen, we have gotten so used to grace. We think we can just do and act any way. And because he's so merciful, it won't matter. Well, he may very well forgive you. What kind of damage did you do while you were acting that way? He is merciful. But you know what, you know what Paul said about this. So we're... Sin abound, grace does more abound. But since grace abound, should I just sin all the more? Absolutely not. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?